Okay, everybody, thanks for coming. I'm Austin Goolsby. I'm one of the two faculty members who helped start the initiative on global markets here at, uh, at Booth. And one of the cornerstones of IGM is our Myron Scholes Global Market Forum series. We are really delighted that we have such a good uh, turnout tonight. The talks are named for Myron Scholes, obviously, in recognition of a donation that he made to help us bring business leaders and policymakers and academics to address the Chicago community and the University of Chicago community on, on topics of current interest. Uh, IGM also receives financial support from AQR Capital Management and Ken and Ann Griffin, and we would like to thank them for their support. This is the only speaking series that's run out of booth where the faculty pick the speakers that we think will excite everybody uh, in the community. So for those of you who are alumni and miss this kind of discussion that you got when you were in school, we think this is probably the series for you. Uh, I'm going to introduce Kyle in just a second. First, I want to put in a little plug for, uh, for IGM. One is for the IGM blog, which I've, I've got on the screen, uh, that I've got on the screen right here. The IGM's intellectual content gets posted on the site, the research papers and, and what the faculty uh, research that it's supporting are, are doing gets put on there. Uh, I want to also alert you to the latest new feature, which shows answers from a panel of economists, not just at Chicago, but at MIT, Princeton, Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, and Chicago, 40 very prominent economists really from across the spectrum, intellectual spectrum, uh, on a number of issues. And I, I know a lot of people say they're tired of hearing about economists that say on the one hand or on the other hand, or you know, you, you get four, four economists, you get five opinions. This panel, where they do a survey pretty much every week, right, every week or two, on some topic of interest. And what's interesting is that the panel has shown that that characterization is not quite right. There are some things where there are strong differences of opinion, but there are a lot of things where there's pretty heavy consensus. And one of them was about Japan's deflation, in which they asked this group of very prominent economists whether they thought that deflation could have been avoided by different monetary policy in Japan. And you can see only 5% of them disagreed, um, though this is a little biased in our favor because nobody had to agree what it was that they had to do. They just agreed if they'd have done something different, it, uh, it wouldn't happen. Um, but uh, I, I think you can see from this uh, that there are, a, uh, there are some interesting things, and you can look up uh, individual economists or you can look at the total, and, and, uh, and so you, sh you should try to check that out. Now that brings us to the topic for today. We're extremely excited to have uh, Kyle Bass here. I'm sure you've read his bio. You, you may uh, likely have heard of him from, uh, from Michael Lewis's book. Uh, it is the case that Kyle is one of the great investors and, and top thinkers about major tail risks really all around the world, but in the U.S. and, and, in, uh, and in other countries was way ahead of this, the game thinking through the issues of what became the housing crisis, um, was way ahead of the game not just forecasting that there would be problems in Europe, but really laying out a framework of who would be the first one to have a problem and the second one and the third one and has, has been spot on uh, with that. So when Kyle Bass has a title that says the coming crisis in Japan, it's, you better pay attention. Uh, when, when Kyle and I first met, it was through a mutual friend, he came to Washington, and, uh, and he gave me a gift that was a little silver coin that he'd minted with Ben Bernanke's face on there, and it said, in Ben we trust. <laughs> now, the government rules being what they are, I was unable to accept that gift because it exceeded the gift threshold, so I had to buy the gift from him. Fortunately, he knew on the spot what the what the value of silver was, you know, for about <laughs> two ounces or whatever it was. So, so I paid him that. Fast forward, I kept that thing, and I and I and I quite enjoyed having it. Then, when I left the government, Ben Bernanke had been the CEA chair, and when he became the CEA chair, he brought his 
his physical chair from being a governor of the Fed over to the CEA, and he left it there. When he became the head of the Fed, he moved back and he left the chair. So there was a chair sitting there for years that just said Mr. Bernanke on it. So the, at the, the CEA and the Fed always meet, um, they meet once a month for lunch, and I would have breakfast with, with Ben uh, myself sometimes. And at the final one of these lunches, I said, you know, Ben, what is with that chair? Why is there a chair over at the CEA that says Mr. Bernanke on it? And he said, oh, that, that must be my old, my old bo Board of Governors chair. He's like, yeah, I don't, I don't need that. And he said, if you want to sell that on eBay, I'll go have these with you. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm pretty sure that's not allowed. But I do have a nice silver coin that I can buy that chair from you with. And I gave him that coin. I said, this is Kyle Bass had this thing minted with a, in Ben We Trust. And I gave him that coin. And I have that chair. If you guys come to my office hours, you can sit in Ben Bernanke's chair. So, uh, so Kyle has a great sense of humor, also has a lot of compelling insights. With the election of Mr. Abe and the nomination of Mr. Kuroda to lead the Bank of Japan, it does seem like Japan may be at a turning point. Uh, hopefully not like the old thing of, you know, four years ago we stood at the edge of the great abyss, and since that time we have taken a great leap forward. You know, we'll see what the, uh, we'll see what, what is to come. We thought this, given those events, this was a perfect time to have a conversation about what to look for in Japan, and we were really thrilled that we could get uh, Kyle, uh, that, that he was willing to come and, sh and share his perspective on that. One thing I would like to note before I turn it over, uh, I know there are a few members of the press here. I'd just like to note some of the rules for the media. The talk and the Q&A um, are both on the record, but the slides uh, that Kyle is going to present and sometimes be referring to are part of an investor presentation. They're not intended for distribution. They're not to be quoted or referenced. Um, and with that, I am uh, pleased to welcome Kyle Bass. Oh, let me say, one. our next show's forum is going to be April 10th when Hans Werner Sinn, who is perhaps the leading advocate of the debate over the euro in Germany, um, is going to be here. So, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, pay attention too. And with that, I'd like to welcome Kyle Bass. Thanks, Austin. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be, at a, uh, be speaking at a school that would have never let me in. So uh, it's a, it's a, I'm really enjoying being here. So um, I'm going to, what I'm going to try to do is get through, you know, it's tough to cover uh, a problem as large as this one in 25 minutes. So I'm just going to get through some highlights. And Q&A uh, is what I'd rather do with all of you. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and I guess, um, let's see, click on the bottom. Do this. Oh. There we go. All right. Oh, did I screw it up? Yeah, All right. Someone's gonna have to show me how to do that. I don't have any MBAs up here right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, it's great, actually, that this is uh, this program is put on by by Myron Scholes. I'm actually going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about the the analysis of the macro situation in Japan. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how it's priced and how I think it's the most interesting option I've ever seen in my entire life. And Scholes is is part of my uh, is part of the calculation. So uh, let's get into uh, just a few things that we're going to talk about: uh, anatomy of the of the zombie economy. Demographics, catalysts, and conclusions. Um, when you talk about two lost decades in Japan, I don't know. Some people refer to it as one. You know, I count the years; it looks like 20 to me. But uh, when you get to looking at uh, it, the Nikkei in blue and nominal GDP uh, in red, there, well, it shows you that we're we're back to where we were in nominal GDP. You know, over 20 years ago, uh, the Nikkei has fallen by about 75 percent, peak to trough, sometimes a little bit more. Real estate's fallen by about 75 percent, peak to trough, and um, um, tax receipts look very similar to to nominal GDP. Um, we all know what the what the central government debt as a percentage of GDP is. I actually think the more relevant 
uh, metrics to use are, are multiples of central government tax revenue. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, just to put things into perspective, uh, Japan crossed one quadrillion yen of uh, government debt. And for those, for those of you at home, that's 1,000 trillion yen. If you tried to count to a quadrillion and you only assumed each number took one second to orate, it would take you 31 million years to get there. Uh, so this is how ridiculous uh, we, we have finally gotten to as space balls, the ludicrous level of, of, um, of debt in Japan. Um, something is really important. One of the things that we focus on at, at, at Heyman and, and, and something I focus on in, with debt sustainability is thinking about when you sail in that zone of insolvency. And many of the white papers written on this subject really focus uh, a lot on um, emerging economies because very few developed economies have actually had to restructure. So in the emerging economies, what's kind of the common denominator for time to restructure is when your debts get to be roughly five times your central government tax revenue. And I'd argue in a developed country, clearly you borrow at lower rates, you can finance more debt that way. The number's a little higher in the developed world. But the top chart is a dual axis chart that I think that we need to pay a lot of attention to. The blue bars are incremental JGB issuance annually. The red line is just the interest check that the, that the government of Japan writes to investors. The bottom chart here is basically the whole interest rate regime uh, ac across the board. So what you see is Japan really went to a full zero in the middle of 01. For all intents and purposes and the discount rate, it went to a zero or half a percent in 96. What you see is as Japan from 98 to roughly 2005 issued more debt than it had ever issued in its history on an annual basis, their interest costs were still plummeting because it takes a while to refi the capital stack as debt comes due. The point I'm trying to make here is when you see the fact that, oh, and by the way, the reason that line has a right angle, the red line, uh, these are their estimates, not mine, just to put things into perspective. Um, you see that even though they're continuing to issue more and more and more debt, what you're seeing now is their, their expenditure for interest has moved up to almost 11 trillion yen. It's about 10 and a half trillion yen. To put that into perspective, their central government tax revenues are roughly 43 trillion yen. So they spend a quarter of their tax revenue on interest alone today, and that's when it's free. Five-year bonds are, what, 17, 20 basis points? I mean, th this is the zone of insolvency. There's no looking back. When you, look, when you understand what this chart's telling you, they've already passed the zone of insolvency. And what's important to think about is Japanese debt stock is about 24 times central government tax revenue. So if Abe and Kuroda and the team and also get into really achieving some kind of inflationary outcome and the swaps move, it's, they're finished, right? If every 100 basis points of cost of capital to the country costs them another 11 trillion yen, a 200 basis point move has their debt service exceeding central government tax revenue. That's how bad it is. Those people wishing for inflation in Japan know not what they wish for, in my opinion. So this is something Austin and I were talking about beforehand. Uh, back, back in 1990, the peak level of tax revenue the government ever brought in, back when the Imperial Palace was worth more than all of Canada, was about 60 trillion yen. If you see, there's been, there have been fits and starts throughout, throughout the time period here, but basically, they're right around 40 trillion yen of tax receipts and you see total expenditures, and by the way, their numbers, not ours. These are not supplemental budget numbers. These are initial budget numbers, which they change four or five times throughout the year. Um, that for the fifth year in a row, they're going to spend more than twice what they make in Japan. This year, they're, they're saying they're, that they're expected to bring in a total of 46 trillion yen, 47, on the tax and, and supplemental side. And they're probably going to spend, with the current stimulus number, about 102 trillion. They're probably going to up that number in either April or June. Just think about what's going on. They're spending more than twice what they make five years in a row. Um, this, is, this is just a busy chart. I'm going to skip this one. Um, we, um, we, at, we at Heyman design, uh, try to understand what kind of uh, indices we could, we could design to indicate what kind of stresses the country was really under. And we designed this finance minister index. And we have now 10 finance ministers in five years. We have five in the last three years. If you're just to take a step back and you see the quantitative analysis that I go through is, in my opinion, is irrefutable. You can't even argue the numbers that I give you because the numbers are the numbers. What you can argue 
are the qualitative perceptions of the participants and how they're likely to act going forward. I think that's the question up for debate. And when you take a few steps back and you realize each data point that I'm going to give you tonight, if you were to write them all on a wall, the proverbial writing is all on the wall. It's the most obvious scenario I've ever seen in my entire adult life. It's just a question of when. When, do, when does some qualitative input change the participant's behavior? Because when that switch is flipped, it happens all at once. The demographics are the most important thing, in, in my opinion. When you look at the U.S., and, and you know, Austin being where he was, we've had several spirited discussions about this. We can't pay for Medicare A through D and Social Security. Come on, we all know this, right? This is a fact. Um, it's how we change it and how we kind of abrogate whatever in, implicit or explicit contracts we have with the people. How we do that going forward is, is something that um, is, I guess, up for debate. But what did Madoff teach us? Like Madoff taught us something really important. You can make promises ad infinitum of future uh, 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 benefits to people as long as you have one thing, right? As long as you have more dummies entering the scheme than exiting. It's really that simple, right? As soon as that relationship changes, the gig's up. Well, we in the U.S. still have population growth. We still have more people entering the workforce than exiting. The people in D.C. can keep doing what they're doing, right? There's no consequence for fiscal profligacy as long as that one relationship exists. In Japan, that's changed. So. These are, these are uh, numbers that basically say they had about 127.9 million people at the peak. Now uh, they're down to about 125 million people. You're going to have a mass problem with the finances of the country when you have more people exiting the workforce and entering, and that's happening right now. So when you look at, at of over a third of the population is over the age of 60 and 25% is over the age of, of 65, and in the developed world that number is around 8%. You have a problem with, with a xenophobic society. I know uh, uh, Anil, or Anil, Anil and I, sorry, good Lord. <laughs> I didn't mean to butcher you there. That might be the worst word, Austin. I'm going to get written up in the post. Um, um, it, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, that uh, <laughs> I forgot where I was. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about it over dinner. Uh, um, the, one of the things that's going on in Japan today is, is the elderly are keeping big stacks of cash by their bedside. When they, when they um, have severe stress and have to call for an ambulance, the ambulances are driving around town until they die. They have to pay off the ambulance drivers to get them to the hospital these days. Um, one thing that's happening, if, if I were right about the population decline, um, Last year, so two years ago, we said they'd sell more adult diapers and kids' diapers in Japan in, in 2012. That press release hit, I think, in August or September. This is an adult diaper fashion show that they were holding over in Japan. Again, the key here is if we're right about the demographics turning, the largest buyers of their debt are – so when you think about their debt, 95 percent of their debt is held uh, internally, and 95 percent of that 95 percent is held institutionally. It's all held in just a few hands. The GPIF, the largest pension fund in the world. Japan Post Bank, the largest bank by deposits in the world. The banking system and the life codes own all the, they own all the bonds. You hear that the people own all the bonds. They own all the bonds through institutions. The institutions own all the bonds. If you're right about that, or if we're right about the demographics changing uh, the financial kind of macro prudential makeup of the country, what would you expect to see? Well, look at these press releases. Japan's giant pension fund was a net seller in fiscal year 2012. Not only did they not buy any more, they actually had to sell some. You don't have to find a marginal buyer. You have to find new buyers to buy everything that all these guys are going to sell. So what you're seeing now is an accelerated rate of central bank balance sheet expansion in Japan. These are the owners uh, of the debt. You guys probably already know this. Um, again, when you look at some of these press releases, they're on the back pages of the Asian Wall Street Journal. They're not going off on CNBC with red lights pointing you to the flow chart of if this happens, you know what happens next? These press releases come and go and no one's paying attention. Again, the writing is all on the wall. It's all there. The largest owners of the bonds have to sell them now. Right at a time in which the country is running the largest fiscal deficits of any developed country in the Western world at 10.5% of GDP. What happened, if you guys remember what happened in Mexico in 95 in the tequila crisis? 
the wealthy Mexicans and the corporate corporations that those wealthy Mexicans ran decided that Mexico was in an untenable position. And they started running with their pesos. They started moving them out of the country. They started acquiring Western assets uh, external to Mexico, and they started running with the currency. And if you remember, that was the beginning of the end for the Mexican currency back in 95. What do you see happening in Japan? The largest M external M&A boom in Japanese history happened in the fourth quarter of last year. You had SoftBank for Sprint for 20 billion. You had Dentsu for Aegis for another five. You had 32 billion uh, in the fourth quarter. You had the, their external acquisition pace was 70% of the U.S.'s last year, an economy that's, that's less than a third the size of the U.S. Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi has their personal savings rate going below zero this year at, in the left chart. Well, that makes sense, right? If, if you were saving your whole life and you had to exit the workforce and start retiring, you'd start harvesting your savings, which is, again, that makes sense to me. These are all pretty easy things to understand. Um, forget that one. Um, I think what happens here, when you think about the psychology of this scenario, you have 20 years of the pro-cyclicality of groupthink that's manifested itself into a situation in which, think about what's happened in Japan. If you, if, the, if you own real estate in Japan, you've lost 75% of your money. If you own the, any of the stocks in Japan, you've lost 75% of your money. What one asset of the Japanese people bought where they've never lost a penny, and it's their own bonds. So at a period in time in which JGBs are at their riskiest point in post-World War II history, the optionality on that asset is cheaper than it's ever been. Right? So the, the Black-Scholes model dramatically misprices risk at secular turning points. It's analogous to driving a race car with a rear, rear view mirror. It's a beautiful thing, actually, if, you, if you're kind of trying to run a hedged portfolio and, and, and look at these kinds of risks. One of the things we were talking about before the, before the speech, there's a new guard in town. We all know uh, Kuroda took over. Here are a few of the quotes uh, in, in looking at kind of you have Kuroda, Iwata, and, and Nakaso. The guy to watch is Nakaso, in my opinion. Um, he's going to interface with the BOJ, uh, the other BOJ members for Kuroda. He's also going to be the guy that takes Kuroda around to the various central banks around the world, and he's going to be the mouthpiece. So anything that he says is actually pretty relevant, and I don't know if, if the world's going to figure that one out yet, but um, I think that, again, taking this situation, this powder keg, this enormous pile of kindling wood, and setting, setting it ablaze or set lighting the fuse, is, is what's going to happen when these guys really start targeting 2% inflation. Central bank balance sheet expansion, um, you know, this is one chart. There's another one that I didn't put in here. This, this one is basically the, the BOJ, ECB, the Fed, BOE, and PBOC. For those of you in the back, the BOJ is the one, the one on the bottom. They're using 100 back in May of 2006 as the, as the starting point. Um, this is, again, some really recent quotes as to what some of the largest owners of these bonds are saying. The bottom one is really important, I think. Japan Pension Fund has too many bonds on the Abe plan. Right? That's, that, that's that oh shit moment when you own you know, the most negatively convex instrument you can possibly put in a portfolio and they tell you they're going to go for inflation. Right? And those, have, those people are the pundits that say, but the Japanese have this cultural ability to um, show a love for their country by, by really supporting their bonds through their, their nationalistic tendencies or their, their love for their nation. And I say, don't confuse the love for your nation with the love for your government, number one. Number two, I think it's really, really important uh, to think about, we conducted a study uh, uh, amongst 100, uh, sorry, 1,009 institutional investors in Japan. And we asked them this question. In the event that Japan were to start to have a bond crisis, i.e. rates would move up 100 basis points, would you be apt to invest more because it's a much higher nominal yield? Or, or would you be apt to, um, you know, go somewhere else with your money? What percentage do you think said they'd invest more? Eight. Eighty-three said they would run, not walk. So you have to realize that the first inalienable right of human nature is self-preservation. And I would say that human nature trumps cultural norms 100% of the time. This is the, EC, this is the BOJ balance sheet. How many times have you heard this, this one 
in, in the marketplace that, that this market that we've been studying for years, I hear, well, they can't have a problem with their financing because they run current account surpluses and they, they can internally fund themselves. Well, how many times have you heard that statement that as long as they run a current account surplus, they can fund themselves? There's naivete in the statement because if you're not taking into account the amplitude of the current account surplus vis-a-vis -vis the fiscal deficit, well, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Needless to say, when you're running a, a current account surplus of half a percent and a fiscal deficit of 11, it's just not true. And when you look at the size of the central bank balance sheet and the expansion, uh, that, that statement becomes axiomatic through induction. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of the way human, the human psyche works, just like U.S. home prices can never go down because you, you start saying it enough, uh, uh, you start to believe it. That's what's happening in Japan, and that's just patently false. Um, they're starting, I think they're starting to show you a little bit of stress. They're starting to advertise um, government bonds and taxi cabs. From the Ministry of Finance's website, you have the number one sumo wrestler in Japan and the worst girl band in the history of man. <laughs> being hired to try to sell bonds to unsuspecting Japanese businessmen. <laughs> we recently, on the MOF website, they had kind of a Q&A for investors, and this is Google Translate, so pardon the translation. But it said, if Japan has a financial collapse, how will the government handle government bonds? And the answer is, government bonds will be redeemed because the government is responsible for them. Please don't worry. Um, we can get into I'll, I'll, the bottom line uh, on the balance of trade. What's happening is the current account's going negative. So not only is it not slightly positive anymore, it's negative. A few things are contributing to that. In, prior to the earthquake and, and the tsunami, uh, Japan did a couple of things that, that, were, that were strange, that they've completely disrupted the supply chain going forward. One is they sole sourced a lot of their auto parts and electronics parts for their industry within Japan. And when the, when the tsunami hit, they had to go source in other ASEAN nations. They completely changed their, their supply chain. Well, that's a secular change. They're not going to sole source back in Japan again. That's one. Two, as you know, 31% of their baseload power was generated by nukes. Well, those are off now. And uh, Japan has no natural resources. They have to bring everything in. And they're trying, they're desperately trying to secure long-term uh, natural resources for crude oil and natural gas and coal and things like that, which really affected their balance of trade. So something that was a mild, or, or sorry, a, a pretty significant contributor to a positive current account has actually swung them in current account negativity. On top of that, the Sengaku crisis is happening. And in the Sengaku crisis, what you're seeing is the Chinese are informally boycotting Japan by both the Chinese SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, and Chinese private sector. They're not buying Japanese goods. And what's interesting about that is, um, and you know, this fight over the Sengakus is, is really a fight over not the rocks and the islands. It's a fight over the natural resources on the seabed. And, and that's why China cares so much about it, and that's why Japan won't let up. Um, this is out of the Wall Street Journal. Look at what auto sales did on the back end of the, this first resurgence of nationalism. So Chinese ex sorry, J Japanese exports to, ch to China have grown 90% over the last decade. They've dropped 34% in Europe and 31% in the U.S. This is a very functionally relevant relationship for Japan. And we think that that, that number's been cut in half. That's 20% of Japanese exports go to China, and that number's dropped by 50% in a few months. And that's secular. All of a sudden, Abe is not going to wake up and love China tomorrow, and, and China's not going to wake up and love Japan tomorrow. So again, all of these things are secular changes in their balance of trade that are really affecting them. Um, we'll skip that one. To put things into perspective for those people that might think this is cyclical or this is going to change, this is the simple balance of trade back to 1960. It doesn't look too cyclical to me. This is a secular problem. It's dragging the current account by almost two full points of GDP. We think the, the current account uh, will be negative, uh, well, as in the last couple of months if you've seen, in the next quarter or so it will. The J curve will help it uh, on the back end of this currency weakening move but it will only slow down the secular decline. It won't reverse it, in my opinion. Japanese industry has been hollowed out over the last 20 years. Um, when you start to think about signs of stress, and what would you expect to see uh, what we monitor? We monitor the swaps marketplace. We monitor cash rates. Swaps are more interesting to us. But we also think about spreads. Because if, if, I were to, if you were to forget about Japan for a second and I were to just draw 
a, a, a generic picture of a country for you. If I were to tell you their GDP is dropping at an annualized nominal rate of about 3.5%, uh, and I were to tell you that they're entering a severe recession, how would you draw their yield curve? Well, I would assume you'd draw an inverted yield curve. Uh, but then I caveat that by saying they have a zero lower bound. Then what will you do? Will you just draw it flat across the zero bound? Well, what's interesting is it's not flat. And the spread here uh, between 10 and 30 years is actually showing me some interesting signs of stress already. This, this should be closer to zero and not at 20-year highs. So you're already starting to see signs of stress on the back end of the curve. They're still pegging the front end, but the back end's kind of flapping in the wind. Um, for those that think the move in the yen has been huge, um, this is the yen that goes back to the early 1970s. The move so far is pretty small. If, um, if I'm right about what's going to happen here, we think the yen really moves, um, let's say, north of 250, and, and we think rates go into the teens in a full bond crisis. Um, so far, cash bonds are not paying attention. So what you've seen so far with this kind of this new thought that Abenomics and, 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 and the new central bank governor and, and his regime can really get Japan to 2% inflation, um, the currency speculators believe that it's, it is a big change in the, in the manner in which the way the administration is working. Most importantly, there's no natural currency purchasing mechanism now that their current account's negative. So um, I think that the bond market's not telling us, on, you know, this is, I think this is the five-year rate. Um, the bond market's not telling us anything yet, but when things move, they'll move all at once. Um, you know what my conclusion is here. So I kind of skipped over a whole bunch of things because I have 25 minutes, but um, I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to, to entertain some Q&A now, and I think there's a mic and someone running, a couple, couple people run around with uh, microphones. All right. Austin, you're the only one that can't ask. Um, Carl, thanks for coming. So uh, let's assume that your um, assumptions are right and Japan will you know, crash around 15. What does it mean for the world and uh, other players like China? Now you know that there are three main countries with, uh, um, with uh, surplus, you know, Germany, China, and Japan, right? And that has to be absorbed somewhere. So now China is facing the same problem that Japan was facing 20 years ago. And Japan's solution was just to uh, have the government uh, you know, uh, uh, assume that the debt that the private sector was uh, entering. So we'll see China not being able to balance the accounts because of Japan collapsing. And we'll see the same scenario happens in maybe 15 years for China. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I think that, so first of all, there are financial implications to us being right, and there are social implications to us being right. I, if we're right about Japan, the social fabric of that region will be torn. And, you know, if you kind of follow historical precedent, it just means that there'll be a war between someone and someone, and it's just not going to be good. I don't know between who and who. I have my own guesses, but I'll leave those out. Um, but I think that when you look at China, China's been this, you know, this, this move from being an export machine to fixed asset investment and carrying the world along with it from the financial crisis. Their banking system has expanded 50% of GDP three years in a row. You know, you think about in the last two years, if the U.S. lent $16 trillion through our banks into our, into our economy, I, I'd bet the over for 8% nominal growth for all you wanted to bet, right? So, and they're still tr having trouble getting the 7.5. Their banking system is 350% of GDP. Their NPLs are sub 1% in China. Um, their average NPLs over the last 20 years have been about 19, and in periods of stress, it's been about 35. If you just do back math, that magic pile of money that China has, the 3.5 trillion of FX reserves, I just don't even think it's there. I mean, it, really, if the NPLs show up in the banks, they're going to have to recap their whole banking system. Um, now, can they throw another turn of GDP in their banking system? Yep. Do I have any idea of when and how they're going to do it? Nope. We have no investments there. But um, I think China is, you know, a bug in search of a windshield as well. I just don't know when. Uh, but again, like, look, there are consequences to this kind of fiscal profligacy that everyone's engaging in. And I think that the, in, in, in extremis, it's Japan. And Japan will be the first one to go. My hope is that um, 
our, our policymakers have front row seats to how this all ends, and maybe it changes their modus operandi because nothing's going to change it, barring something like this. Oh, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, Japan holds a fair amount of treasuries. What happens to that holding on their exercise side of the balance sheet when all this stuff happens? It's mm, a good question. So um, they have about $990 billion of U.S. treasuries as an as a asset of the government, right, with their FX reserves. And so I kind of think about this in a couple of different ways. First of all, the two largest contributors to the IMF happen to be the two largest debtor nations in the world. It's an interesting stat. Um, there is no lender of last resort for Japan, right? The IMF was designed to kind of help really small nations with balance of payments problems. It wasn't, it wasn't even thought of uh, to even make medium-sized loans to bail out countries like it's trying to do now. So I kind of think it as dip loan money. Uh, if you have $990 billion worth of U.S. Treasuries, you better hang on to it. Um, Austin and I were talking beforehand. If you want to go spend it and try and hang on for a little longer, uh, pre problem or bond crisis in Japan, I'll just put it into context. Let's assume you had an entity that was willing to swap Japan $990 billion worth of yen for those treasuries. So there'd be basically what I'm saying is let's take out FX movement, let's take out rates movement in the U.S. Let's just assume someone swaps them. That wouldn't fund their fiscal deficit for more than 18 months. Well, then what? You know, it's analogous to selling the family silver or running up credit card debt. It wouldn't engender confidence, I can promise you that. Um, but, I, but I do think that um, they do have a couple of assets on the balance sheet, and, and they're going to need those uh, when the times get tough. So I, if I were them, I'd hang on. If uh, tomorrow you got put in charge of Japan, what would you do? I'd quit. <laughs> yeah, I think they're, they're already in the zone of insolvency. There's nothing you can do. I mean, as you saw the last 10 finance ministers, one guy actually killed himself, Nakagawa, and, the, and then the guy that took over after him, after ratifying the 2011 budget, checked himself into a hospital and, and literally had a press release that said it was after ratifying the budget, I, I literally was overcome with anxiety. I mean, that, you don't see 10 finance ministers in five years unless they're real problems, you know? Um, I, there isn't, there's nothing they can do. You know, what, what I worry about is, you know, um, I think that these people are gonna lose so much of their purchasing power at the wrong period of time in their lives, given the age of the population, that again, it's gonna tear the social fabric of the country. There's nothing you can, they can do, in my opinion. Uh, you spoke a little bit about the swaps market. Uh, what is it specifically that you're looking for that would possibly be the trigger to turn the JGBs and turn the bond market? Yeah, I think that if and when the swaps marketplace believes that they can get to 2% inflation, um, that blows the bond market up. So I guess the, the swaps will lead everything else, in my opinion. And so we, we follow those carefully every night across the curve. So far, no one believes it, but the key is, is as soon as they move, it's too late. You won't be able to get involved. And, and so right now, it's just something we're monitoring. Here we go. Sorry about that. So um, do you think the capital markets can attack both Japan and Europe simultaneously? And how long do you think Europe's going to be in the dumps? Um, the chronology of events is really important. So when I, if, if and when the Japanese situation materializes, I think that U.S. and Japanese nominal rates will go negative, and that'll be the time to make the bet against the U.S. and Germany on the rates perspective, but not now. Um, with Europe, you know, they've fixed nothing, right? Um, uh, when you look at the way, manner in which we're positioned, we own some situ special situation assets in the U.S. and all of our hedges are with European equity um, because I think that that's, that's also something that's likely to come. I don't, we don't know when, uh, but I don't have a great answer for can it happen simultaneously. I guess not, and if it does, our rates will really go negative for a short period of time, but I think, I think Japan happens first. Yeah.
Do you have a forecast for Japanese equities, particularly the DK index? Yeah, I think that um, if you, there are two ways to think about that, and this is the economist one, one hand on the other hand, but there, is a, 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 there are kind of two precedents that I think about. One is the tequila crisis in Mexico in 95. Right, they devalued their currency roughly 60% overnight after, after many affirmations that they wouldn't devalue it. They just did because they had to. And in theory, if you devalue your currency 60%, what happens, what should happen to your equity market in nominal terms? It should take off, right? What happened in Mexico? Their equities dropped 70% in 40 days. So you lost 60 in the currency and 70 in the stocks when that happened. Um, again, the, 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 other, the other side of the coin is, you know, if you, if you boil the frog slowly, uh, he doesn't know he's getting boiled in that Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, so the Zimbabwean equity market, as they dialed up inflation, you know, you were really doing well in your stock market portfolio, and stocks did, your, your portfolio did really well, and then after 10 years, you, tr you tried to harvest it, and you could buy three eggs with the money because you weren't paying attention to, to real rates of return. Both of those scenarios are, I think, when it's a shock, equities don't do well. And the people that own Japanese equities today, in my opinion, are kind of macro tourists. They think cheaper yen, buy stocks. They don't realize Japanese industry has been hollowed out. Some of the companies will do a little bit better, but some of them are not going to do any better, and it's not going to change the secular trend. So um, I, think, I think it's kind of analogous to picking up a dime in front of a bulldozer. I think it's pretty... Pretty, a pretty scary thing for me is to be long Japanese equities right now. It's not to say it won't work for another 20% or 30% or whatever the number is. I'm just, it won't, not with my money there, it won't. For a retail investor, how would you profit from Japan's fall? <laughs> um, I don't really have a good one for you there. The, the, the instruments available to retail investors are just, they're not, they're not there. And not knowing your, your personal financial situation, you know, if you have $100 million in ISDAs and quib letters, well, then we can talk. But if you don't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just too much of a problem. I mean, you, the convexity is not there for you is what I'm telling you, unfortunately. So a world that, uh, that sees Japan fail, it's a very different qualitatively world than it is right now. I'm kind of wondering what's the next domino and what does it do to really investment strategies in the future? Yeah, you know, if I had that crystal ball, I wouldn't be standing up here enough. I, I you know, we, I worry about these things all the time because, you know, look, we, all, we all live in this world. I really hope I'm wrong. I'm only spending a little bit of money every year making, making sure this hedge position is on there. Um, if I'm wrong and nominal growth uh, is there and we don't have any problems and there's no consequences for fiscal profligacy and we live in Krugman's world, just sign me up. Unfortunately, you know, ign ignorance would be bliss in that world. Um, I tend to think that there are going to be consequences. They're going to be soon. And, um, it, it, you know, the domino effects are important. The best time in the world to invest in Japan is afterwards, right? When Currencies typically overshoot because they discount the PV of the rates curve going forward, which won't be that way after a restructuring. Um, so currencies get too cheap, stocks get too cheap, and that's, that's when you move your money in. Um, so, you know, you just have to have a plan, and I think the plan is, is to be – my personal plan is just to be rational about all of this. Don't believe anything that all these people are telling you that run central banks because they'll never tell you the truth until it's too late. You know, if you remember – remember when Juncker was interviewed? In 2011, uh, the, 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 one of the heads of the European uh, Financial Council, uh, I don't know if you remember this, this quote, but the press went and asked him and said, we heard there's a, a special meeting to discuss Greece's restructuring, kind of May 2011, this before Greece restructured their bonds. And he said, oh, no, there was no meeting. I don't know what you're talking about. And then they went to a couple other finance ministers and said, you know, what happened in the meeting? He said, oh, we talked about Greece and this, and Juncker was there. And they went back to Juncker and they said, what, what you told us that, there wasn't a meeting, and these other two guys just said, you were in the meeting. And he said, look, when things become serious, you just have to lie. <laughs> I mean, you can go look this up. This is a quote. This is a quote. But again, the Mexican government told you the day before they devalued 60%, they said, we will not default, we will not devalue. And then the next day you woke up, they said, well, we just had to. They're never going to tell you this is coming. You have to just make these determinations on your own and, 
you know, protect yourself from it. Own physical assets that are, that are um, productive, and that's the only way to kind of s save yourself from the stupidity of these people. Any more? You know, um, Japan had all these great things you talk about, you know, over the past 20 years. They had this current account surplus. I know recently it's gone down, but in America we're running a $65 billion a month, you know, uh, trade deficit. If a situation happens where the dominoes start to fall uh, relative to how Japan will look, how will the U.S. turn out? Um, again, I, I think our rates actually go... In, I think they go much lower in that environment because of this Pavlovian response to safety, not as an endorsement of our fiscal policy or our greatness in legislative success. Uh, just I think, um, I think our rates go lower. Um, when I go to D.C., and I'm sure Austin had the same experience, you meet with people on Senate Banking, House Financial Services Committee, the guys that are really the key policymakers, and you start talking to them about, hey, you've, you've got to start changing the way you're doing things. We need to be thoughtful about this. Um, and they say, well, where are 10-year rates? And then, you know, you say one, 180, and they say, well, I don't see a crisis. And yeah, but, but right now they're saying, they're using the bond market as their, as their, um, as their barometer for crisis. You know, and, and again, you know, that would really lead you to make some really bad investments throughout your life if, that, if you used the barometer that was a coincident or lagging indicator. Um, so I think uh, the U.S. is on a terrible path. Our debts are five times our central government tax revenue. We're not in the zone of insolvency yet if we're willing to, you know, restructure Medicare A through D and Social Security. And, look, I'm a, I'm a fan of restructuring those and raising taxes. I'm probably upsetting the whole room by saying that, but and it's, it's what you have to do. But, you know, come on, there's, there's no impetus to do that. So I, we're on the same path, and we're just years behind. We also have the biggest blue water navy. That's a good thing. So um, there are th there are unusual um, high volatility. I mean volume in CME Group dollar denominated Nikkei futures. So does that mean that this can be a really good instrument for investors to capitalize? I think that's prima facie evidence of macro tourists, right? It's a whole bunch of equity crossover accounts in the U.S. and macro players that have this Pavlovian response to a weekend buy stocks. You know, that, that's perfect evidence of, of my point, my opinion. So uh, I read with, uh, with a little bit of uh, irony the G7 and the rich countries, and everybody's broke except Canada maybe. So, so what, what – it seems to me that the big problem is – expectations of the people and isn't there because you theoretically could communicate to the people and change what they get for what they give that that it sounds like Japan is way beyond the brink but mm -hmm. what about other countries I mean isn't that really what this boils down to is entitlements versus you know the rules have changed and our government's a shambles or our finances a shambles yeah, I mean, I, again, I think as long as you have population growth and kind of net new people coming into the system, you can make those promises and don't have to live up to them. It's kind of really simple. When you get into a scenario in which you have a secular decline in population, the kind of the rubber meets the road and you blow apart. Um, we have years before that happens here. But, you know, look, it, the debt stock only matters when it's untenable, and I don't think it's untenable in the U.S. today unless you want to bring on balance sheet the contingent liabilities, which we can change. You know, um, it, but who's going to change them? You know, here, here's, a great, here's a great story. In, it, with Medicare D, right, this is, this is the Republicans' way that they, that they got Bush a second term, right? Carl Rove sat in a room, and he said, we need to buy the votes of the elderly. Well, we just need to give them free drugs. And so they said his economic council stood up, two of the guys did, and said, but you can never pay for it. It's going to cost 1, 1.4% 1 of GDP for an eternity, and you can never pay for it. And he said, sit down. We need these votes. And so that's how Medicare D got passed. And then um, I asked Carl last year in a kind of a public forum, I said, I got to ask the first question. I was like, 
Horseshack and welcome back Cotter's class, you know. I was like, oh, oh, Leo, pick me. And I said, so, so um, was Medicare D a good idea? Looking back, and you know, he shifted in his chair three or four times. And he said, well, you know, three things happened with that. The first was, you know, the actuaries really missed the number of people that would sign up. And I said, for free drugs? How could they possibly miss that? <laughs> and then he said, and the second thing they missed was the rapidity at which they were going to sign up. And I said, and then the room was laughing so hard no one heard the third thing. <laughs> but that's how laws get passed. That's how Medicare D, it, it wasn't the benevolence of Karl Rove. It was Karl Rove buying votes. And so as a politician, whether you're Obama or whoever else is next, if you, if you endeavor to change free drugs for everyone, you lose. So you just can't do it. You know, that's, that's, the, real, those are the, real, that's the reality of the situation. So we're just going to keep, we should make Krugman president and we'll just keep spending until things go poorly. To what extent could the sort of crisis element of the scenario be blunted if the government of Japan you know, liberalizes immigration, prints the money, um, you know, cuts spending and raises taxes? I love that one. And then uh, and monkeys fly out of you know where? I mean, <laughs> come on. It's, it's uh, all be unicorns and rainbows. And Again, I, I want to live in that world. Unfortunately, I don't, but I'd like to live in I mean, they're the most xenophobic society in the world. They're the most homogenized society in the world. Of 125 million people, less than 3 million are non-Japanese. They hate the Koreans. They hate the Chinese. There is no love lost between anyone over there. And for immigration reform, and I, don't, I don't know who you're going to invite in, and I don't know how you're going to get them to. And if you do, what's going to happen to wages? I mean, from what I'm reading, we need wage inflation. That isn't going to encourage wage inflation. It's just, it's an untenable scenario. I just don't think it can be fixed. Maybe I'm just too apoplectic about this scenario. I don't know. Any more? Uh, Kyle, when you look today in the capital markets at the tactical asymmetry that exists among the various financial instruments to, to take advantage of the cheap optionality, what is that instrument? And number two, you, you referenced the fact that you would own the right physical assets, and what would be those right physical assets to own? Yeah, I mean, you know, like apartments, oil wells, things that are productive assets, and then, you know, operating businesses that have a little bit of fixed leverage are probably something that is going to do well. As far as the instruments are concerned, I'll give you guys, I, I'll give you guys a little bit of an idea. So we don't talk about exactly where we are or what we do. You know, we kind of, we tell you how much we love Coke, but we're not going to give you the formula to build it, to, to make it. But I think um, the AIG of the world is back, and here, here's what I mean by that. I have 27-year-old kids selling me one-year jump risk in Japan for less than one basis point, $5 billion worth at a time. You know why? Because it's outside of a 95% VAR, it's less than one year to maturity, so guess what the regulatory capital hit is for the bank? It rhymes with hero. <laughs> right? And if the bell tolls at the end of the year, the 27-year-old kid gets a bonus. And if he blows the bank to smithereens, ah, he got a paycheck all year. This, we're right back there. I mean, the brevity of financial memory is only about two years. And um, I wouldn't sell nuclear holocaust risk in Dallas for less than a basis point. Right? It's, I mean, you should be fired for thinking about selling something for less than 50 basis points. You know? And yet, this is happening again. And it's happening in huge size. You know, huge. We bought half a trillion dollars worth of these options. And... Interestingly enough, recently, one of the biggest banks in the world called me and asked me if I'd close my position. Well, that was an interesting day for us. That happened to me in 2007, right before the mortgages cracked. But um, they said, you know, we ran some new risk tests. And I said, really? <laughs> and they said, yeah, you know, our new stress scenario is a little bit more punitive than the last one. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, we don't want to share, you know, our proprietary secrets of our bank with you. And I said, okay, well, then I'm not closing it. And they said, whoa, 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 well, how about, you know, our old one will have rates being stressed 50 basis points, and the new one has rates being stressed 400. And I said, well, yeah, 400, that would really hurt you in this trade, wouldn't it? And they said, yeah, we'd, we'd like to close that one. And I said, well, I'd like to, but I'm not going to do that for you, so I'm sorry. You know, you know. But anyway, they're starting to realize that why would they run a stress test like that? Well, who, who would have them run that stress test? This is, this is happening. 
I think there was one more. Was there one more? I'm not sure you're going to like this question, but it's oh, very God. simple. What are you buying? Gold or guns or both or neither? Austin and I blew up, blew up, blew up a beaver dam together, actually. Um, it, was a great, it was a great day in Texas history. Uh, <laughs> the beavers were safe, I think. Uh, um, look, again, I, only, I don't get paid to be an optimist. I don't get paid to be a pessimist either. I just get paid to be a realist, and I want to be a prudent fiduciary of the capital. That's all I care about. And then I, then I tend to care about social issues in the world. And if I'm right, the social issues are going to be really difficult. Do I think things are going to spin out of control into anarchy and a need for guns? No. Do I think the payment systems will still function? I do. I just think what they're going to pay you with is not going to be, it's going to be wampum. But it's still going to work. And, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a scenario where things are just a little bit tougher. You know, we've gone through a scenario where things got tough and now all of a sudden there are 1,400 new billionaires. So maybe the capital is misallocated, Austin. I don't know. Uh, but I think going forward, uh, things are just going to be a little tougher. And um, I don't think you have to go, go buy guns. If you asked me, if I, if I had to buy one, so the retail investor in the back, this is a good one. If you asked me which one investment would you make for the next 10 years and just go to the beach and go spear fishing for 10 years, which I love doing, um, I would buy gold and yen and just go to sleep, right? I'd sell yen, buy gold, go to sleep, and wake up 10 years later and you'll be fine, right? But don't do that with all your money and, you know, Put a little bit of that on if you want to, but that, I think that's the single best investment you can make um, today if you're just trying to make one. All right, thank you. Thank All you very right. much. Awesome. You. Okay. Neil told me I was supposed to tell you that thing about April 10th is the next one. I was supposed to say it now. I wasn't supposed to say it in the introduction. So April 10th. Hans Werner Sen is coming to talk about the future of the euro. Now, the Beaver Dam, if you could have seen this. We, we came out there, uh, and we weren't there five minutes. We showed up, and I, and I had two of our small kids, my wife and I. And Kyle said, this is great. You're just in time. We're going to blow up a Beaver Dam. And we were like, what does that mean? I thought, I thought it was a, he was talking about something else. No, we drive out. And this is a special explosives that you have to shoot them to get it to blow up. And so we're this. I was like, is it, what, what is it? <laughs> My kids are still like, you've never blown anything up. Why can't we blow something like that up? If you had saw that, you, would, you, you wouldn't be waiting to buy a gun. You'd be like, I've got to see that again. Like that, you, you, could, you, you could get a lot of gross for a movie just filming that and, uh, and showing it. It's been a great pleasure for us, as you can see. Uh, the insights that Kyle has are, are very compelling and they make you rethink, you know, your, your beach house strategy as well as where's your food, make sure you got it packed in the basement. Water, you can go three weeks without food. You can only go three days without water, so make sure you have your uh, water. Thanks, everybody, for coming.